uh, out of this webinar. So we want to really get down to uh, what we're here to talk about with insurance. And is this this the way my team acts every time I come back from Zeke? What's over here, Rich? <laughs> I don't know where you found that picture, but it wasn't in my office. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so they're so excited that we came back to this course and we're going to be saving our patients' lives and, and we're going to help them. And then, and then we tell them, hey, by the way, we're going to have to do some insurance billing for these patients. Furthermore, it's going to be medical insurance billing. And, and you know, the whole team's walking around uh, like this, uh, uh, worried and, and concerned about how we got to do this, uh, this new procedure in our office. And we're hopefully here to wish you good luck with it. Uh, we're, we're going to help with that too. And by the way, I can see someone's already put in a question. We'll try to type uh, into those questions as we go. If you have questions, uh, type them into the questions, not into the chat, but into the questions. And if you'd like to ask a verbal question, which we certainly encourage, uh, you can raise your, your hand and we'll, we'll do that as well. And we will open it up to, to questions at the end. So we'll try to be talk, uh, do the questions along the way and uh, as many as we can answer. And then at the end, we'll certainly answer all of them as well as any verbal questions that we have. This is changing, is it? Well, the whole Thank thing you. is changing. Think, think about when we got into this guy almost 15 years ago, you know, the first guy through the wall always gets bloody, you know, and, and uh, if you're just getting into this, uh, your timing is pretty good because, uh, you know, it's certainly easier to do this now and to get paid for it now than it was uh, 10 years ago or something like that. But, but you know, th this is different, you know. Uh, dental sleep medicine is not uh, quite the same. It's, you know, you got dental and medicine in the same uh, topic there, and, and so it's just a little bit different, and you got to think about uh, this is a process. You know, it's a, it's a learning process. You have to learn a new language. You have to learn a, a new uh, vocabulary. You, you have to learn, you know, about the dental devices. You have to learn about sleep studies. You, there's just a lot of things to learn, and I think you need to give yourself a little bit of latitude, but you also have to have a plan to, to make this succeed. As you guys are getting into this, uh, we're glad you're here to, to learn about uh, the uh, the ins and outs of, of billing for dental sleep medicine. Absolutely. It looks like maybe we had a little problem with the screen there. I, we got it working earlier. I, I think I'm it's seeing, working now. I'm uh, seeing your screen. So I'm just really good. Yeah. yeah. So I'm typing uh, about the screen. I think we, we've got it. Got it. Got it going well. So uh, you know, dental, uh, billing for dental sleep is one of what we call the pillars. Uh, as far as what you need to, uh, to put in your practice, we need to find systems for screening for testing, and we need a system to basically implement and to, and to manage this as far as the practice goes. And then today we're going to talk about, as we can see here, one of the biggest pillars is, is insurance uh, billing. And that's uh, a, a challenge that if you master uh, all these three what we call pillars of dental sleep, you'll have a, a, a thriving dental sleep practice before you know what happened. And you can be like me and Rich sitting around, the legs kicked up, um, uh, not doing extraction shots or root canals, and they're doing dental sleep all the time. And it's, it is really rewarding and fun. It's not without challenges, but it truly can be uh, one of the uh, most enjoyable aspects of dentistry. We, we, we sort of love it. So if you want a quick answer on how to do this, what is it? Go ahead, Rich. No, I'm just saying, what's, you know, who, who's doing this? You know, how do you, how do you do it, right? So the quick answer is just hire, hire somebody else to do it, right? I mean, because they're, uh, that there, there's some ins and outs to this, and, and I think uh, it, we, we, there are several hurdles. One of the analogies uh, we use when, when we teach this is think about uh, running around the football field, you know, at your high school, and, and you got about 10 hurdles, and you, you got to jump over those hurdles. And, and dental sleep medicine has several hurdles, and probably the biggest one is insurance billing. So I think we think it's a great idea to use a third-party billing. There are several out there. You can give us a call. We're happy to uh, recommend one, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But but at least it gets your foot in the door, and, it, and it's not such a big hurdle that it keeps you from, from doing this and, and saving lives and, and making money at it and feeling good about it. So that's the quick answer. Right. The and, and what you get to <laughs> Well, we're going to show you how to do this yourself, and, and we encourage you to, once you get busy doing dental sleep, to do it yourself. We, we certainly think most offices can. And I think the biggest challenge really is that once we start doing a mandibular advancement with device, we're crossing a line. Oh, it went too fast, sorry. Into uh, medicine. 
from dentistry into medicine. And uh, that's where this changes. I, I talked to someone at the meeting today, and uh, one of the doctors there was saying, you know, I don't feel comfortable with getting involved in, in, in medicine and medical. I said, well, you know, then maybe you shouldn't do dental sleep because the moment you start making many of advanced devices for acne patients, we are doing what is considered a medical procedure. So uh, that's okay. I mean, it's, it's something that we should embrace and not be afraid of. Uh, I do think we've been trained a little bit differently. Does this look familiar uh, to you, the ethics uh, that, that we've been, that been taught as dentists, that you expect to be paid in full for fees? And if not, you declare us to the third parties, which in this case are insurance companies. Is that what you, you know, Rich, and I have been in this long well, time? All, we all have that, that, that drilled into our heads from day one, right? I mean, the state board reminds us of that and everything. And, you know, here you... I mean, think about you, you as the dentist or the office manager, you know, we got several different people listening here tonight, and uh, you go to the doctor yourself, uh, how much is this going to cost? You know, sometimes you can't even get an answer, you know, I mean, it's, well, we just bill your insurance, and you know, if, if, if they pay, great, if they don't, you know, we send you a bill, pay it, don't pay it, we don't care, so that that's kind of what we inherit when we cross that line from dental into medical, it is this patient perception, okay, of what they expect to pay or not pay, and, and then that contrasts in, in a very stark way with what we were taught as dentists, so what, what does the dental, uh, American Dental Association. Oh, there we go. It's so the next slide. Yeah. yeah, it's basically it says that a dentist who accepts uh, an insurance payment uh, under a copayment uh, as a payment in full without disclosing this to the insurance company that this pay, uh, payment uh, the patient's making is the is the full payment. Uh, they're considered to be uh, uh, sorry, I'm reading this. Uh, you got and, it. To not so, be collected in an overdoing. The uh, the dashboard's hiding part of what this says on my screen is why I, I had to kind of remember what it said underneath it. But you know, essentially what that's saying is, look, we accept this money from the insurance company, and that's all we're going to get. We're supposed to tell the insurance company that we didn't collect the rest from the patient. That's what we've been told. That's our code of ethics. And that that's the longer you've been a bit of us, the more it's been ingrained in the And the uh, physicians have their own code of ethics, the AMA. A code of ethics is almost 180 degrees different from this. It's basically saying that you know we 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 need to be conscientious of what uh, what healthcare costs and the patients are made made aware of this through these payments. But if this copayment is a barrier to them getting this needed care uh, due to financial hardship, we should no we should forgive uh, or will they? Well, I think the reason Rich has finally made sense to me is. You know, sometimes this truly can be life and death. Medicine, if we, someone comes in and they have a very severe acne, 75 events an hour, they just had a stroke, they've got three stents, and they, they, they're they worried to whatever, the, the closes on CPAP, they literally can't wear CPAP for whatever reason, and they're on the, they're, they're, they're down to their last dime, uh, are we supposed to say, no, if you don't pay the difference, you go on somewhere else? And, and we read their name in the obituary the next day. I mean, we, we really need to help these people out, and I how think does, that's why the code of ethics is a little bit different. I mean, I mean that's, actually, yeah. happened, that's happened to us, guy, right? I mean, that happened to me yeah. earlier. Yeah. We were trying to get somebody a gap exception, which we'll talk about, you know, later. And and during that time, you know, we got to call me this guy's walk and that he had passed away. So th this is a serious thing. So you've got to look at that. You've seen the medical side. You already know the dental side. So this is one of those paradigm shifts that I that we want you to at least think about, okay, as you try to figure out how this fits into your practice and what you do. We, we're here to, to give you a lot of information. This is not rocket science, but there are a couple of different ways that you can look at. You, you got to decide, are you working as a dentist, are you working as a, uh, on the dental side of things or the medical side of things? So you, you've seen we got both of those right out of the ADA Code of Ethics and right out of the AMA Code of Ethics. So uh, I think we need to give ourselves a little bit of latitude uh, from, from what the dental, science, dental side of that says anyway as we move forward. Great. Yeah, and I agree, and uh, I see there's a hand raised. We're going to get to some of these questions in a bit. If you're typing in the questions and type them in, we'll try to answer them as we go. But we, we really want to get a lot of information to get through. We'll try to get through on time, and we will I promise to stay as late as we need to answer any verbal or typed in questions. But, you know, really what this amounts to 
the patients are coming in, they want the treatment, and they want to know how much it's going to cost them. And is my insurance covering at least part of this? They want to know that that insurance that they have is contributing to this and that you know, you're the kind of provider that's going to work with their insurance. And that's if you can get those two answers uh, uh, reasonable for your patients, you're going to do a ton of, of dental sleep devices. And I think we can, we can help you with that. Um, you know, you can charge cash for this if you want. You can just say, look, I'm not going to mess with my medical insurance, and I'm just going to come up with a cash fee. And, uh, you know, that's okay. I mean, that's better than not doing anything for your patients. But I can tell you, you're not going to reach outside of your own practice for that. The physicians aren't going to refer you patients uh, if, if they find out that their patients, uh, that you don't accept uh, their, their insurance or work with them on their insurance. It's just going to seal that possibility of referrals away. It's not. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, I'd like to have a nickel guy for every time I've heard a dentist say, you know, I can sell $10,000, you know, construct, you know, mouth cases all day long, but man, it's sure hard to sell a couple thousand dollar dental device. And, and that part of that really is this, uh, this paradigm shift between dentistry and medicine and what, what we have inherited as dentists practicing in this medical arena now. But, uh, but there's a lot of things at play here. So when we think about what do you charge for this guy, give, give us the quick lesson on, on, you know, how you think you should, a dentist should calculate a fee. Right, I'll go through this very quickly. We also have this in our uh, Dental Sleep Medicine Insider magazine with, on some of the back issues. You can go and look that up online and, and see a little bit more detail. Essentially, we want to know how much money you would like to make in order to make this profitable doing dental sleep in your practice as you would be doing a, another procedure that you would like to do, like a crown or something. And that's how much money you need to collect. It may, you may bill differently depending on your bill or model. So uh, an example of that would be that if we had a crown that we uh, charge 1300 and the numbers don't mean much here, it's just the procedure that we're talking about here. And if it takes us a couple hours of chair time or an hour of doctor time, the lab bill around $300, then after the lab bill we have a profit of $1,000, $1, which equates to $1,000 for the, the doctor time or $500 for our chair time. You know, it's just pretty much simple math. And so if you want to... You know, you can do this with your own numbers, and then you can reverse this, and we can give you some numbers if you're efficient at doing dental sleep. Now, these numbers used to be a lot more in our practices before we had efficient systems in place to make us do this uh, very efficiently and well and, 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 and a good job for our patients without a lot of waste of time. Uh, because certainly, my, my team spends less than two and a half hours of their time per patient. I certainly spend less than an hour of my time. Uh, per patient with the systems that we have in place. So what we do is we reverse the, those numbers. In this case, you would take a 500 if you want to go by chair time, and that's 500 times 2 and a half, 1250, as you can see. The doctor time's still 1,000. And you may want to just average these two. Because one thing about dental sleep, if you do this well, uh, it can be much more team-driven uh, than something like a crown. But the, 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 the team can do the vast majority of the work. Uh, as opposed to a crown, the doctor has to be in there anesthetizing in most states and, and doing the um, uh, and doing the prep itself. So you just average the two if you want to and then you add your lab fee and then that's the fee in this doctor's office that they would need to collect on 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 each case or on average in order to make them happy. And you know when, when you do the math on this Rich it doesn't come out to you know some people think, oh you're gonna get three, four, five thousand dollars a case for this and hey God love you if you get that, but I don't think you need that to do that. I think most practices can be enough. A fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollar range uh, uh, of what they actually collect on average for the patient. Going to be this for that, which they can sometimes. Uh, great. Right. Very good. Thank you for going through that, guys. What what kind of decisions do you have to make as you look at doing this? So, you know, basically we're going to talk about three things, right? We're going to talk about how you deal with Medicare, and we're going to talk about how you deal with in-network stuff and out-of-network stuff, and, and then the, the, the specific billing systems, okay, as you get into this. You, you're going to accept assignment of insurance or not, so those types of things. So uh, let's jump. Uh, well, of course, we're billing medical and not dental. Uh, we need to know that, so... Uh, let's jump right in here, Guy, and I think we're going to start talking about uh, what what does insurance cover, you know, as we think about this. Does it cover snoring? Have you ever gotten a patient covered for snoring? No, never. How about upper airway syndrome? 
Not not that I can recall. Okay. So, so really, what right. you're looking at. Okay. I've got one, I've one up on you. <laughs> You've always got a one up me, don't you? Yeah, I've always got a one up me. You know, that was something that had the gold medal plan, you know, was, you yeah. know, ex president of some big oil company or something. Uh, so, uh, but for the most part, you know, we don't get paid for this unless somebody has a sleep study and they are actually diagnosed with sleep apnea. Right? The old code was 327.23. The new code is G47.33. Uh, you guys should know that. That doesn't come from us. That comes from the physician who reads the sleep study and makes the diagnosis. Uh, what about the other one there, guy? I don't think the as you have here is widely accepted. So in general, we're going to go with the, the, the G47.33 code. Okay, so, so that's the diagnosis code. Absolutely. And so before we see our patients, and this uh, kind of uh, goes into some of the other courses we do when it comes to cons uh, doing consults and so forth, uh, we, we do need some information. And this can also uh, relate to insurance billing. So we need a copy of the sleep test. In our situation, we, we need so, uh, some answers to questions that we do via our web portal, portal and DS3. Uh, and, and those questions help us justify our treatment that they act as our clinical notes, and we certainly want to know what the uh, what the the uh, the recovery is for this particular patient. Uh, uh, did it interact with uh, for their uh, Basically, we want to come up with an estimate for the patient for the dollar uh, and the amount uh, out of pocket for that patient. Here's what I said: you go to check looks like so we can quickly see what their benefits are. Uh, and then the other things that we're always going to need, in addition to the ones I just went over, uh, are it is a, a letter of medical necessity and prescription. And this comes from the physician, uh, ideally the primary care. In, in most cases, that's where we like it to come from. That basically says that this patient uh, is medically necessary to have this mandible advancement device. And the insurance companies pretty much are mandating this uh, on almost every case. So we're going to put it under the always side and it's just always a good idea to have that and then you have to have a way to submit that as well. I mean, you, a lot of the dental softwares don't uh, allow for submission of medical codes. Do you want to talk about the main here with uh, you? You kind of want to you lobby to put this one on the other side, don't you? Yeah, well, you know, how, how much is the May? If it's 80 percent, do we move it over to always, you know, 90 percent? So, you know, you one of the things that you got to think about, okay, is when, when we think about this, we, we're talking about, you know, what we need prior to a consultation even. So when you think about, you know, as you walk a patient through this process, right, and, and, and we want to treat these people, we want to file a claim, and we want to get paid, right? That's probably why we're all on this webinar tonight, right? So if you have the sleep study and the questionnaire, clinical notes, and the prescription letter of medical necessity, you're going to get paid most of the time. If you throw in the authorization, okay, uh, th then the odds that you're going to get paid go up significantly. But that's something that you just simply have to find out, right? Is, does this uh, treatment procedure need to be pre-authorized? And, and it will tell you, they will tell you yes or no. And if it is, well, then you get the authorization. Uh, yes. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. That's uh, something that we deal mostly with Medicare patients. Uh, but, you know, there you've got, you know, if, if for every patient you had every single one of those things, then you are doing everything that you can do to actually uh, not only file a claim, but to get paid. And that's, that's what we're here for is to learn, learn about uh, increasing uh, our success rates at, at getting paid for doing the dental classes. Absolutely. So uh, once we have that information ready, uh, we're ready to uh, get going and make some decisions. Uh, and when it comes to Medicare, uh, that's the first decision we're going to have to make. And uh, before we talk about the individual decisions, just understand how Medicare works. Medicare uh, basically does cover dental devices, E0486 now. And what they cover depends on what region you're in, the LCD in other words. And they will, Medicare will cover about 80% of what they allow for your area, and the a patient would pay uh, the other 20%, or in most cases, a lot of patients have supplemental insurance that will cover uh, that 20%. Uh, you do have to use a Medicare-approved device 
For as far as we're concerned, uh, the two that we use are the TAP uh, or the SUAD or HERPS, which are essentially kind of the same device. And those are the two devices, uh, uh, by considering the SUAD and the HERPS as one, one type uh, that we use in, in our offices. So remember, a global fee, you know what that means with a global fee is that that uh, it, it involves everything that you do in treating the patient. You know, and Medicare has also said that you've got to, uh, you know, these things have to last five years. So we'll, we'll get into this, but you, you kind of got to pick, you, you know, don't assume that uh, Medicare knows what they're doing. You know, you make phone calls. It's, it's amazing how you can call them and, 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 and just get different answers to the same question on different days, right? So, but... For looking at the, the 10,000 foot overview and you're just looking down at Medicare, you've got to decide if you're going to opt out or you're going to opt in. And then, thank goodness, there's this kind of in-between kind of weird thing where you could become a DME supplier and a Medicare provider and you could choose to participate or not participate. So, let's get into it, guys. Okay? Yeah, I like your new slide here. So this, I think, makes it uh, a whole lot uh, easier to, to, to understand and to, and, to, and, and to look at. So you're going to go down one of these paths, and we're going to go through each of them. We recommend the middle path, just to, to cut to the chase on this, because it gives you the most flexibility, and it also allows us to, to build Medicare so we can tap into, into that, that amount. So I think, first of all, go ahead. Well, the, that middle path allows us to balance the limitations and difference as well, but we'll get into that. So, first of all, opt out. How do you do that? What's involved in it? You sign a contract, right? You, you, you call up Medicare, you get it offline. It's about two pages, I think. Uh, it lasts uh, one year for each page, uh, so two years, right? And, and when you do this, you basically are you're saying I'm not dealing with Medicare at all. So you can't file a claim for Medicare, nor can a patient that you see file a claim for Medicare on their own behalf. That's where this advanced beneficiary notice comes in. And if you think about this, I think really that's that's designed to protect the patient, isn't it, Guy? When the patient comes into your office, and it's designed to keep the patient from from being taken advantage of, thinking that insurance is going to pay for something that in reality they're not going to, right? Absolutely. I think that's the main main purpose. And I, you know, unless you're just wanting to do cash for your patients, uh, we recommend that you become a non-participating provider. And you really, it's a disservice to your patient to not uh, allow them to tap into this money that is rightfully there. So, uh, uh, you know, if you want to do this, we want you to tell how, and you can't reverse it. I know there were minutes to who did this, and now we're, gosh, I wish I hadn't. You've got it, you've got two years commitment that you've done. And this isn't necessarily the easy route, route either. There's work involved in, in, in opting out. It's not just a, a simple phone call or something either. So uh, to opt in, uh, I know some offices do that as well. And uh, you know, to do this, you're going to become a DME provider with the uh, the 855S, and in this case, you're going to accept the Medicare fees as the, as the amount, and you cannot balance bill the patient. But what you will get is 5% more allowable amount on average than if you uh, are, are not participating uh, as far as the you know, allowable. You think 5% more? A, 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 a whopping 5% more of the already low fee. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, if you're a cardiologist, for example, and 90% of your patients are 65 or older, okay, you have to do this. You have to opt in, right? So it's the CMS 460 application. You have to go by their guidelines, accept their fees. You cannot balance with the patient above what the Medicare accepted fee is. So uh, if you're in a town and you're 62 years old and you are the youngest guy in town, then you might consider doing this, right? But uh, anything less than that, then, then you probably shouldn't. And thanks, thank goodness, you know, we've got the opt-out, we've got the opt-in, and then we have this kind of in-between middle thing. So this is this is very hard to call, you know, what do you call this? You, you'll hear a lot of terms. You know, are you participating in Medicaid? Are you non-participating? And this slide right here, this is really how you need to look at this. Uh, 
Tell your New York guy there, I can hear that siren going down. All right. Can you hear that? I'm sorry. <laughs> all night long, on the, all night long, I'm hearing that stuff. I can't wait to get back on Anaheim Island. Sorry for the right. for the service. So, yeah. so you opt out two years, right? You opt in, and, and, and thank goodness we have this kind of in between here where we can choose to participate or not participate on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? We're still going to do the DME. The 855S is the application that we use, okay? Uh, now we get 5% less, right, even if we participate on this arm because we've not opted in. So that 5% that isn't a deal breaker when you're talking about, you know, $50 for a dental device, right? At uh, 50 to 100 dollars, depending on what part of the country you're in and what Medicare allows. But the, the nice thing about this is that you can't balance bill the patient the difference. So I, I'm in Texas. In my jurisdiction, Medicare allows about 1,100 dollars for this is all they allow, and they pay about 850 on. That's it, right? So that, that's very difficult to do if you're going to pay $400, $500 for a lab fee for a dental device. Uh, so we can choose to not participate. We can do this. I think our next slide goes into a little bit of that, guy. But, but you have to become a DME provider to do this as well. You know, that's the 855S application that you saw in the previous part. You can't build that out yourself, right? Uh, but you do. You, you know, once you do that, you do have to, uh, you know, abide by the Medicare rules, and you still have to use the Medicare approved devices and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so, once you get the application and you become a Medicare uh, non-participating provider, here's the the the, the key to it. Uh, on your uh, 1500 form, or however your your software works, you're going to have the option to either accept assignment of benefits or not. So that means, are the checks going to come to me if I accept assignment of benefits? If I check that box, then I'm going to get the check. The checks are going to come to me, but I cannot balance bill the patient. Uh, basically, I'm becoming a provider uh, for that one particular case. In general, in my office, most of the time, I don't check the assignment of benefits. I let the, the 800 and, 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 and whatever it is, uh, $50, $24, something like that, that, that goes to the patient. And then uh, the patient pays me directly for whatever we agreed to as far as their uh, balance on that. The supplemental in, we'll know if they have supplemental in. So most of the time, I don't check the assignment of benefits. But when I check the assignment of benefits, is on that patient I talked about at the very beginning of the webinar. This guy who's really medically fragile and maybe uh, can't afford the treatment, I'm not going to let that guy leave my office and, and have a heart attack if I can help him. Uh, we're going we're to go ahead and check the box. We're going to accept what Medicare allows, and we've done a good thing. Uh, you tell me, I don't. <laughs> On the CMS 1500 claim form, this is box 27. Okay? So you guys that have to fill that form out, this is box 27. If you click yes on that box, that means the check comes to you. Medicare is going to pay you 5% more. You can only bill the patient for the difference between what, what Medicare is going to pay and what Medicare allows. And again, in Texas, that's $1,150 or something like that, right? You, if you charge $2,000, you can't charge them the other $1,150 above that, right? So you're treated like you did as you get 5% less. If you check no on that box, then you don't get to keep the check, right? It goes to the patient. So you might want to keep that in mind as you create your financial arrangements and you go over this with patients. Absolutely. So and, uh, yeah, right? I mean, that's Medicare in a nutshell. You, you opt out, you opt in, or, or you kind of do this thing. And then what, what are the kind of remember part of this? Remember that these, uh, you can only bill the 0486 out every five years. I, uh, other insurances vary, but Medicare is it's written in stone at this point, five years. Uh, we didn't really talk about the left side, Part B, because uh, Medicare is uh, kind of been back and forth on that. But as far as our last conversation with Medicare, they, they're they not allowing dentists to bill for Part B uh, side of, of for the exams and so forth. So uh, just to, to, to keep it safe, we're just going to keep talking about the E0.6, and that's what you bill for. And 
in order to be approved, uh, the, the patients have to meet certain criteria. Uh, this is kind of the, the nitty gritty of it as it comes straight from Medicare. Uh, we kind of have summarized that for you on this slide. Essentially, Medicare will cover the device if the patient is mild to moderate uh, apnea. Basically, if they have the mild apnea, they have to have a comorbidity associated with the, with the apnea, such as maybe hypertension or excessive daytime sleepiness. If they're in the moderate category, then they don't have to have that comorbidity. If they're severe, they have to try CPAP first. And so you've got to make sure, back to what we had on our always need side, if it's Medicare and uh, they're severe, they're going to have to have a CPAP, uh, something in the in the um, we need to know that it's been referred by a physician and it's performed by a dentist. So I do think that covers it, except for this is where you go to get started. And uh, if you're looking with uh, third-party billers that help for dental sleep medicine, most of them will help you with this for a for a fee. And you very much may consider doing that because it's a it's it's a fair amount of work. It's certainly not uh, uh, not uh, Undoable or non doable is an odd word here for, for your auxiliaries to do this, but they don't have time. Uh, there's uh, companies that will help you. And that's where you, you go. Yeah, sorry. It is only 67 pages long. That's all. <laughs> a two page uh, 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 attention span. So. <laughs> okay, so that's it for right, on to, okay. Yeah, on to in and out of network. So, you know, as we build, we, we, we build this. Uh, this is a big deal, right? I mean, if you are, are any of you out there uh, in this network with a medical insurance company, if you are, type it in the question box for me, okay? Because we we get in front of thousands of dentists a year, and there just aren't very many people who are in network, right? What does it take to get in network, right? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a lengthy process, and you you've actually done it with a few, so I've uh, heard your your tale, I think one of them took you several years to, to get an agreement. And, and the, one of the bigger parts of the agreement is, is they want to pay you two cents for this, and, and you want a lot more than that. So you've got to agree to an amount that they're going to pay for each of these, uh, for this procedure, the E0486, maybe other codes that you, you may be able to submit. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a time factor in there, and some uh, insurance companies won't even let dentists in that work. Uh, some of them will let oral surgeons in network. So those, those are the challenges for getting in network. If you do get in network, the uh, easier part of it is it is an easier billing system. We know they allow X amount, and, it, and it's just simple math. You, you you look at their deductible, how much they're supposed to pay, how much you're supposed to collect, and, and, and you just uh, uh, do the math, and, and it's easy for you and your team. Um, the... the the, the, the positive also is oftentimes these uh, patients who have in network benefits, their uh, deductibles are less oftentimes for in network versus uh, out of network when it comes to billing. Yeah, it's usually it's about half, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but but again, if you how you do that is you would contact the provider relations of a particular insurance company, right, and and then. You would start that application process. How do I get in network? I'm a dentist, but I want to get in your med medical network. They'll give you an application. You just go through that. You know, it's, uh, you know, all your licenses and all that stuff. You know, I think sometimes it's a, it includes a kidney as well. But uh, but if you don't do that, then, then I didn't get anybody to type in the question box, guy, yes, I'm in network. So, you know, we got 40 or plus 45, 50. 55 offices on here, or whatever it is, and uh, you know, no, nobody's in network. So let's talk about out of network, right? Because that's how we're going to build it. Somebody comes in with Aetna insurance into your office, and do you cover this? How much does it cost, right? That's what patients want to ask. That's what they want to know. So now we're out of network. We're not in network. You have a little bit more flexibility in how you do this, right? You are not uh, obligated contractually to a particular fee, for example, right? And, and some of these vary state to state and all that other kind of stuff. So I, I think the plus side of this is you can get reimbursed more, right? Because you heard guys say, man, it took me years to do that. It didn't take years to get the provider relations and the contract done, but it took a long time to get the fee up to where I thought it was appropriate.
right? Because they want to give you two cents, like I said, you want to charge $2 million, right? Well, how do you meet in the middle somewhere? That's what you do. But it, it does require a little bit more work, don't you think, Guy? On, 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 it, because you don't have that, that, hey, the fee's already set by the insurance company, right? Your deductible's 1000 you've met it all, they pay 80%, your part's 20%. It, it's a little bit more... Uh, a little there's bit more variance, isn't it? Yeah. There's a lot more variance because we don't know the allowable amount. And so you're going to get different amounts based on uh, a lot of factors there, the deductibles and so forth, but also the allowable amount. And so it can become more confusing to the, to the team doing that. You know, they won't tell you what the allowable is? And they usually won't tell the patient either. So it's hard to give a patient Here's exactly what you're going to owe, uh, because we don't know what the, the allowable amount's going to be until we submit. So you have to have a system in place where you can give the patient a, a ballpark figure and maybe a maximum out of pocket that you're willing to, to take the risk on with that patient because uh, they, they want to know. They want to know what the, the maximum out of pocket will be, and that, that's how we handle it. And the, one of the advantages, I think, that you touched on, but I want to make clear, if you're in network um, and you don't collect from the patient uh, the parts that you're supposed to, uh, if you do that on a regular basis, you can be uh, in violation of your contract with that insurance company and you can uh, find yourself in trouble. Uh, with this, when you're out of network, you don't have a contract that you've agreed to with the insurance company. So uh, there's some more flexibility on that, and that's where maybe forgiving uh, financial hardships is, 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 is more uh, allowable in the out-of-network billing system. What this really boils down to is, is, is you've got to come up with a system to what you're going to charge the patient, how you're going to come up with an estimated uh, amount that they're going to owe and an estimated maximum out of pocket. And once you do that, you can present that to the patient and, uh, and, and, and you're going to get a high success treatment, but what you're also going to get is an apparent amount per case. You may not get the same, you may get more for one case, less for another case, and that's why you got to look at averages, maybe, uh, when you're looking at how much you really want uh, to make you happy to do this back to our exercise that we did earlier on in the presentation. Yeah, I like I like the way you put that. The last thing, uh, put that slide back up there one more time, guy, right before we start, because we've we kind of been alluding to these billing systems and what we're talking about and what we're going to talk about next. That bill, that is this deduction. So if somebody comes in and they've got an Aetna PPO, Okay, and you are not in network. What well, just so happens that there isn't a dentist in your town who is in network with that, right? So there is a gap in that patient's coverage. So that's what you would want to apply for. And the advantage of a gap, okay, is that the patient can now go out of their network. They can go out of their PTO network to go see Dr. Guy Yatros because he's not in network, and they get to use their in-network benefits. So they've got that $1,000 deductible instead of the 2000 right, like you were talking about before, Guy. So the gap coverage is, is, is a very nice tool to have in your pocket uh, as you look at uh, what, what you're really trying to figure out, isn't it, Guy? What, how much the patient's going to pay, right? And, Absolutely. And that, when we get into billing systems, that's that's kind of how we have to we have to think about that. We're going to give you guys a couple of different ways to look at this and, and how to do. It. Very good. The gap coverage is the simple part, and it can take a fair amount of whoever's doing that for the office's time. So if they're using a third-party builder, uh, that's where they're earning their uh, their keep. Uh, if you're having your team do this uh, and they're telling you it's taking a, a little bit of time, it does. Uh, to, to check on all these things. And it requires a phone call, uh, which can take, uh, you know, on the road, like 10 minutes to an hour or more. So uh, understand that it's a, a time consuming process, but well worth it. So, you know, we're going to talk about billing systems. Uh, again, I know some of you have, have typed in questions. We're, we're getting to those and we'll, we'll, we'll be finished uh, by the, the end of the hour here to have uh, any questions that anybody else wants to ask. And we appreciate you, you all listening in. The billing Systems really, we're talking about billing systems for out of network. If you're in network, the billing system is what you would agree to. 
with an uh, in-network uh, insurance company that you've made that, 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 that contract with. And understand that Rich has, I think, a couple of insurance companies he's in-network with. So you may have some that you're in-network with, and then the rest you may be uh, doing out-of-network billing for. So there may be ways you're doing this in your office. But we, uh, we, uh, we talked about the, the service. That's the way I ran my desk. For, uh, but you should uh, 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 tie in years and that worked well for it but it did not work well when it came to dental sleep medicine it's just a different mindset it's medicine and uh, you're going to have less cases to say a, a yes to treatment less patients rather to say yes to treatment if you don't at least a step. And by that, the check, that what box was that and again, Rich? Box 27. 27. So you have box 27 on the form. You're going to click, and even for these non-Medicare patients, if you check that, that means the checks are going to come to you. And so what we can do there is we can look at, uh, at how much we think they're going to allow, and we can tell a patient, this is, this part of the check's going to come to me. We're going to pay the difference. Uh, if it doesn't pay the difference, what I mean by fixed amount there is, let's say we're going to bill at two thousand dollars, and now and I think the insurance is going to pay fifteen hundred of it. Well, then patient, you're going to give me five hundred, and uh, and that fifteen hundred is going to come to me. But lo and behold, I don't get fifteen hundred. Maybe I only get you know, twelve hundred. Uh, I'm going to go back to that patient and say, well, it, uh, it you need to pay me that three hundred because I need my twenty five hundred. And if you do that, patients aren't as likely to say yes to treatment because all they're going to know is they could be liable up to the total amount you're billing. And so what I mean by a flexible system is, you know, if I'm willing to take a little risk here, and uh, whatever I'm going to build this at, whatever I think they're going to pay, I need to set a cap for my patient and be willing to, to live with that. And if you do that, uh, the chance of saying yes to treatment are a, a, a lot higher because uh, you're taking a little bit of risk with, 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 with that particular system. Um, anything more you want to add on that, Rich, before we talk about billing no. codes in particular? I, I think you did that very good. Very well. Okay, billing codes, uh, I think we've got another slide coming up here that uh, explains that better. Uh, if you want to be safe, Rich, what do you do? I think you just do the first one, don't you? Okay, there's a delay there. I know we got a little because uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You know, Rich. Okay. Yeah, do, yeah. Do you just do these 0.6 for most of all the cases, well, right? Yeah, for several years now, that's all we've done. You know, we 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 you can bill for some of these other things, but there's really a varying degree of whether or not you get paid for these things. So we've already kind of talked about Medicare separately, right? We're talking more about you know, regular types of insurance and PPOs and that kind of stuff, and you're doing this out of network. So, I I think, okay, as you do this, you should you should think about the consultation that you have to do. You should think about the exam. You should think about the impressions and the bite that you have to take. You should think about delivering the device. You should think about the three or four times you have to follow up and manage the side effects, because that's all you get to bill for, for the most part, and get paid. So, so you have to think about all of those things when you do that. That goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning, Guy, about how long this is going to take, right? So you need to count on this taking about three hours as you get started, and I think it could be a little bit more efficient, you know, uh, give or take a little bit. But uh, you can bill for some of these other things. So the Dental Sleep Solutions does a lot of billing for a lot of dentists, and we have – you know, a lot of information about what people get paid for and what they don't. I think more than anything, Guy, it's 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 more regionally specific, isn't it? I mean, just yeah. little pockets where people get paid consistently for impressions, for example, but 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 not across the country. Right, and I and I think the, the key thing is that your documentation's in order as well. So uh, you, you know, some people do all right with the sleep studies even. Uh, and whether you want to bill it to the appointments, but whatever you're going to bill for, you've got to have the proper documentation. Uh, e 086 doesn't require as much because you've got, you, you can prove you did that. You've got a lab slip, 
You've got where you paid the lab for it. I take pictures of my of my devices and my patients now. And so no one's going to really question whether you did that or not. All these other things, uh, especially uh, to consultation appointments and things like that, the only proof you have is your chart notes. And they better be in order and they better uh, cover what the medical code says it should cover or you're going to make trouble. I personally do DDS3 where we do that comprehensive exam, which doesn't take uh, very long because we're, we're very efficient at doing it with our, with our, with our software. Uh, I drill out a, a, a consultation appointment with that, uh, that day that we do the exam. And then uh, one thing to be really important is you don't bill out the easy reporting six until you deliver. Uh, Medicare says you cannot bill it out at the end of the questions. Uh, most of the other insurance companies are going that direction. So uh, you're going to only want to bill out that e point six code at the delivery. So we would do the, at the exam, we bill out a, a code and at the delivery typically. And that's the only two codes that, that I, Personally, use in my practice uh, because I think that's 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 relatively sick. Rich is even a little more conservative by just uh, doing the the, the one the one code. Yeah, but you hit the nail on the head there, guy. When you said if you do these other things, you know, in the medical side of things, and I think that's your next couple of these slides, right? You, you have to use the current CPT <coughs> coding. Excuse me, right? So that changed in October of 2015, right? You get those books, they cost about, I don't know, 150, 200 bucks, right? If you want to buy it. Thank goodness we don't have a medical office, right, guy? Well, we got to use 10,000 different codes. We only have a couple. But if you're going to do a follow up code or, 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 a, or a, even a consultation, you're going to use 99203, for example. That book tells you it's that have to do in order to bill for that code. And then you, like you said, Guy, you have to make sure that you document that that is exactly what you do, okay? Because you will get audited by uh, medical insurance companies when you cross this line and you get into this. And that I, we're in no way are we trying to scare anybody off from doing this. This is how we make our living, is helping dentists do this. Uh, for the most part. So we want to encourage you to do this, but you just have to be careful about how you do it. If that code says you've got to check this system and that system and you've got to do this and that, then, then just document that that's what you've done. I think we beat that up, Doc. Yes, we have one question that came in a little earlier. I don't know if you, I, I'm having trouble reading the question with, uh, with running the slide program, but uh, you are not in network uh, with private insurance. Private insurance is different than Medicare. You actually, unless you do something, you are considered out of network. It's a little different than Medicare. Medicare, you really have to make a decision in or out. Uh, you've got to make a decision one way or another. If you make no decision with private pay insurance, you are automatically considered out of network until you uh, choose to do so uh, otherwise. There's some other questions there. I'm going to get, get to in just a minute. A couple. All right, very, very good. Uh, we're getting close to the end. I think we're going to try to be finished on time. Uh, the billing systems, we've gone through these, and then really, uh, those are the questions you have to answer. I think we've got Medicare covered pretty well. I think we did the in and out network. And then the billing system, I know we didn't give you specific billing systems as far as flexibility and uh, flexible systems and, and how you come up with those amounts. That really kind of depends on on, on, on a lot of factors that really need to be discussed that, to, to really come up with that specific. And that's why we offer uh, 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 insurance billing and our association, DS3, we do that for you. There's other offices, uh, uh, not sorry, other insurance billers, third party billers we can hook you up with as well. Thank you. Offices really knows, and no one gets confused. I think that's the biggest problem is that anybody's going to be talking to that patient about money. I mean, you, know, you need to be comfortable with this. They don't need to be him hawing around and uh, and and, and uh, well, I don't know how do we do this. And the last patient we did this with, you've got to, uh, as Rich likes to say, uh, talk me to fake it until you make it, and uh, act like you've done it before, and have a system that that, that the patient seems that that he's comfortable with uh, everyone in the office. And I can tell you, it makes, it makes a difference. The less they have to pay, the more cases you'll do. In my practice, for years, I did, just like I 
Again, the, uh, the, uh, the dental practice, cash up front, check with the patient. Less than a third of the people I saw from the consultation said yes to treatment. I, I track these numbers. I'm very big about tracking numbers in my practice. Once I at least accepted some of the money uh, from the from the insurance and let the patient pay a portion, we were you know near 50 percent. But once I became more more flexible or, or allowed patients to, uh, to 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 have a maximum amount of pocket, and if, if the patient rules treatment, I want them usually to pay me something so I make no value. But I found that if I, in, in worst case, they don't go down about five hundred dollars out of pocket and take the risk on what I'm going to get with. With, uh, and I'm not saying I do that on every case, but if I need to do that uh, and when they need it and, and otherwise we would collect uh, other amounts, uh, we're, we're pushing three out of four. I just said, yeah, uh, they have the patients and have a system in place. So I hope that the, you're excited about saving people's lives, because that's really what we do. Uh, if you come to one of our seminars, we can share with you story after story about how we uh, help people live better and, and literally uh, uh, help them live longer and some of the earlier stories where maybe that didn't work out and, and that's that's what um, uh, it keeps us going and, and, and you know on top of that you can make money doing this if you only did six devices a year and, and uh, you, you got a, a lab cost of 350 which is $50 more than the, than the clear dream and even if you're doing an average amount of around 2500 even if you pay for DS3 which again you want a free trial uh, just type in free trial, we'll give you one uh, for the next couple of weeks. No, no obligation whatsoever, just to, we'll show you what we, we can do for you. Uh, the free trial, you can, you can be down to uh, to, to 10000 uh, a year that you're making, six devices a month, you're at uh, uh, 10000 nearly, 9300 uh, One a month, you're at 22, you know, you, do, well, you can do the math, you're at four weeks, or four a month rather, you're at almost to six figures. So, I uh, hope, uh, hope this helped you and that you're the expert now on billing. Uh, there's uh, what we do and, and what uh, the, the free trial will be involved. And I think in case you joined us a little bit later, uh, we do these hands-on courses. We do uh, uh, two-day courses. You get a sleep study. Home sleep study proof. The doctor gets that. The um, doctor also can get one uh, dental device made as well. And uh, two days to see. Uh, Day and a half, so it goes till about one o'clock the second day. Uh, nine ninety, uh, nine ninety nine is your normal fee, and I don't think we've ever offered this before, but it's our Cyber Tuesday special. Type in, uh, you want to go to one of these courses and uh, register by tomorrow. We're going to take three hundred dollars off that. I think I forgot to mention you can get three this for that amount too. So, uh, you know, of course, uh, seven hundred dollars roughly. Uh, you, you, you can't beat that. So we, we promise you'll enjoy the course and learn you, a lot. Ray, what do you think? You know, we get in front of a lot of dentists every year. You know, when we do this, uh, you know, what do you what do you think the the difference is between the the guys that come to our course and we talk to them, right? What what do you think the difference is between the, the guy that takes it? it that, that's that's not a sexist statement, right? The gal we have it's just as many women that are successful as men. But, but the, the gal that takes it and runs with it and, and is successful, and the one that really struggles, what do you, you know, what is, is, are there common themes to the, the, the one that's successful as opposed to the, you know, the, the one who's not? Well, uh, other than the fact that the does, we, we teach you how to be efficient at doing this. And so if, if they come to one of our courses and they're using our system, uh, we have very, very high success rates. Other than that, I think taking the time, yeah, we do have a great system. It does take some effort on your part. And I think team members who are dedicated and, and, and the more team members that come to these courses and get involved in our, in our systems help too. So I think uh, uh, understanding how to make this efficient and each little piece put together, that's exactly what we do with our parents do that so that they, it's not just this big unknown. And uh, okay. having team members who are accountable, yes. That's, that's, is, is that's what I think. That's what you think. Point. Uh, well, I think that's a good point. You know, I, I think that uh, I think if you guys have to understand a couple of things, I would maybe add to that guy would be uh, you have to understand there's a learning curve to it. You know, you, you had that slide up in the beginning, right? Change is a process. It's not an event. So it's a process to learning this. It's a process to implementing it into your practice. You know, I, I think one of the common things that a dentist 
us be successful is they break out a half a day a week and all they do is dental sleep medicine. You know, the, you don't have that, hey, Dr. Yatros, you know, you got a hygiene check. Dr. Yatros, you got to numb the patient in too. Dr. Yatros, you have an emergency coming in. You know, Dr. Yatros, <laughs> you know this, you, you just go, okay, most dentists don't work Wednesday afternoons or Fridays, right? So take half a day and just do dental sleep medicine. And if you don't have any patients, then, you know, then call up a couple of doctors in town. Go visit them. Uh, you know, log into the DS3. We have a complete 10 step system there. We get an online course, right? You, you know, you get 10 units of CE for it, for your EGD and stuff like that. You're doing something that relates to dental sleep medicine during that week. Think, do that, you know, six months from now, you're not sitting around doing nothing anymore. You, you've, you've, You've got a marketing plan in place now. You've got, you know, uh, brochures. You've got posters up in your office. You've got, you know, you're, you're, you're working on it, but you're not trying to fit it into every single other at, in between all of your other patients. Uh, I think that's a good point to take away from this. Yeah, and we have our 10 set program that's designed to do just that. I mean, it, it helps walk uh, through these staff meetings, uh, team meetings. Uh, here's what, what you need to know. Here's the next implementation step. And that, I really, really excited to put together a year ago and really help fill in all those gaps and, and to get the offices up and up and running. So, uh, look at that, Rich. We're done on time. Uh, is a, I'm pulling up the questions. I think I finally figured out how to get the box expanded there. Looks like you've done pretty well at answering a lot of these. We're going to put our contact information up here so that people can have that as well. Uh, you know, we, we, we hope we can help you. Again, if you want to do a free trial, I'll type that in. If you want to come along the courses at that steepest discount, uh, or, or, um, uh, we can, we can sign up. I see that, I think we have a, a program coming up in the, uh, uh, three of the next year and then something we can, uh, more than one schedule. Are uh, there any questions, Rich, that, uh, if you've got okay. a question, type it in or raise your hand? Yeah, we've got, I'll stay on a couple more minutes, Guy, and answer these questions if you want. I mean, we, we really want to encourage you guys to do this. We really do, you know, and, and we try to give you a, a couple of tips there, you know, between the two of us, Guy, what do we have now, 25 years or more, you know, doing this, 30 years, something like that, of doing this. And, I think it's 25, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have made thousands and thousands of these devices, so uh, you, you, you've got to... Uh, you know, to get a system, you got to have a plan, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, and uh, do, just take time to implement, you know, because it, nothing's going to happen, right, Especially unless you work at it. So. Right, and then uh, we make all that uh, uh, easier. Uh, I see a question here, do we like the AMA appliance? Sure. We like that appliance a lot. It's one of the least expensive one. Keller's uh, fee on that is one of the least expensive uh, of the EMAs, and it's a, a, a good uh, uh, appliance for the cost, and it's very comfortable. It fits on a lot of uh, a, a patient's needs. Some patients it's contraindicated for, uh, and maybe heavy brushers and things like that, but if I personally wear it sometimes. I kind of mix my devices up and wear, uh, wear one now, and the other ones are at times just to mix them up. And a lot of patients really like that. It's, it's small, uh, they don't, uh, it doesn't show with the, you know, there's, you know, uh, newlyweds or something like that, so uh, it certainly has its place. Uh, we're going to be doing more of these courses uh, in the future, and uh, uh, next year we're going to have a schedule set up, but in the past we've always done some on device selection. We, we did one for uh, Keller on device selection la uh, a few months ago, and uh, we, we have four devices that we do quite re uh, regularly in the EMA as well. Yeah, we have one more question guy there about what's the most comfortable device. You know, I, 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 how many of you worn that? I've maybe worn six or seven different ones. And what we have to remember is, you know, my personal experience isn't the same thing as a patient's, for example. So, you know, it's a little bit of a loaded question. So, uh, a tap is a comfortable device, okay? But if you've got a class two bite and it's very deep, 
a clap, a, a tap is not always the most comfortable device, right, Dad? Because you've got to open the vertical so much, right, to get it. In that case, an EMA might be more comfortable. So I think as a general rule, I, I think the dorsals are probably, and the EMA are probably the more comfortable. What do you say, Dad? Yeah, EMA's up there on the dorsal. But it depends. Yeah, you're right, it has to do with the patient. Yeah, I mean, but for two loved ones, and, you know, I think we, we all think this an awful lot. Uh, when we do our course on our one-hour webinar on, uh, on device selection, we'll give you a little clue to what, how it starts out. We show a dartboard and say you can use this for most cases, and uh, the truth of the matter is if you only had one device to select from, uh, we would, most patients would wear it comfortably. You know, if you only had one car to, to drive and there weren't all these choices out there, we'd be fine. We'd get to work, we'd get to where we need to go. But hey, I like this one better, I like that one better. Once the moment there's choices in anything, it, 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 it makes it a little bit more complicated. Let's don't overthink it. Uh, the, the device selection, although I, I don't say it is, is, is unimportant, it's probably one of the least important things that, and that is oftentimes overthought about, overcomplicated. Uh, these devices all do the same thing. They move the jaw forward, they keep the jaw from falling back, and, uh, and they keep the airway open. Most people can get used to most of them. Good point. Good point, Dad. Okay. Um, I smell that shrimp cooking in the end. The results. I took so much. Uh, uh, last shimmer. The plate. Is there a mess? Set up. Weird. And so if we think about our dental devices, we think about CPAP. Our dental devices treat snoring better than CPAP does, okay? So 95% of the time, our dental devices will move a patient six points on a zero to 10 scale of snoring, okay? So if, if the patient comes in at 10, we tell them 95% of the time we're gonna get you to four. So that might have been a talk with this particular patient where you had you had that talk before, they might not be disgruntled. So they come in and they have a, a problem with snoring. Well, rate your snoring, right? Again, this is where a questionnaire becomes invaluable as you do this, right? And that's what Guy and I have spent the last 10 years of our lives designing and putting together through the Dental Sleep Solutions of the DS3 system. So, yeah, absolutely. From a, you know, a lot of things. Then they're, they're more accepting of, of what's going on. Uh, the, the other thing I would say that you can do that really helps with the story is to increase nasal cadence. We use nose cones a lot, okay? Uh, you back air nose cones. You get them online. They're 25 bucks. They come in small, medium, and large. Uh, we make a lot of referrals to ENTs, right? Septoplastics, terminectomies. You know, things like that. So you, you can always do that. Uh, and there's probably not a lot more you can do if you're at 90%. Sometimes you can get a patient to go out a little bit farther if you work for them slow. Yeah. Hey, Rich, that, that's, exact, that's exactly the way I would answer that question. Uh, <laughs> they're almost verbatim. Uh, the only thing I would else, else suggest is when it comes to the nose, uh, to look at, uh, at allergies. Uh, I'm recommending, uh, as long as their physician doesn't uh, disagree, that they can buy over-the-counter nasal cord, cord that they have uh, the, all that stuff's available, to, uh, nasal steroids are available over-the-counter now, and those help in addition to the nose cones. And then lastly, if it's a device like a dorsal design, adding elastics can, can help as well. It can help promote more nasal breathing uh, as, as well, and that can make a huge difference. Very good, guys. I have forgotten about that. Rosa, what, what kind of device are they in? I mean, you said they came from CPAP, their HI was 8.3, right? Yeah. So, you know, maybe nasal paint CPAPs like that. Uh, I can tell you that the uh, updated practice parameters that the AASM and AADS tip came out with is, uh, uh, says that the dental devices treat snoring better than CPAP does. So that's looking at, at uh, more than 10 studies that do that. So, you, you know, you might have something that's a little bit different. So, guys, she's in a somnibet fusion, so that might be a great uh, time to add the elastics. Uh, yeah, it absolutely. Can, it could make a huge difference. Yeah, it's not usable. It could make a huge difference. And the last thing we'll say, these don't always do everything. I mean, dental sleep's not uh, 100%. We don't 100% time. 
We help thousands of patients. It's very rewarding, but it's not 100%. And sometimes we have to say, hey, we're, you know, we're a physician now when we're doing this. The, the doctor sometimes has to look at the patient and say, hey, you know what? We've done all we can here. Well, except here's Rosa. She says she's fit at nose cones, right? He can still make a score with the nose cones in. That, that doesn't mean that, that you can't, uh, you know, do all of these things together. We, we're going to do the best job that we can, and that's where knowledge is power, right? So it sounds like you're doing some of this stuff, right? And you may get to the point where you go, you know what, that, that's as good as it gets. Because remember, snoring can be very nasally, and it can be very high, and it can be very palatable. Right? There are some okay. home sleep testing devices that actually measure the frequency of the snoring, and they can tell you if it's more palatal or more nasal, right? So in that right. particular instance, right, uh, it, it sounds like you're doing about the best that you can. And yeah, it's absolutely. You know, three or four weeks and go for it. Hey, Rich, we got another question about billing, and this is a billing webinar. I know we're on over, but we're happy that we just pulled over and answer this question. So, Eric, uh, as a question, I think we should answer it because it is, does have to do with uh, insurance. I see someone has some ad rates too. So uh, I'll stay on there as well because we need to get these answered. Uh, how do you build gap coverage is the question for out on network patients. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a whole billing department that does that. I've never personally done it. It's a phone. And you, uh, when you're doing the verification of benefits and you're asking if they need pre-authorization, uh, one of the questions you ask is, uh, do you uh, allow for gap coverage? Uh, and they'll uh, tell you. And, and, and so, uh, what are the coverage amounts? You know, what's the percentage of the, that they pay? Uh, uh, you know, for uh, in that in network. Here's another one, guy. Uh, is the only crystal ball? Is the crystal ball firing up? <laughs> Get dust off the crystal ball. Let's see what we say. I, I don't. I, you know, got written uh, but I, I, I know that uh, I, I doubt that you have the answer to that, do you? Well, I'm 54, and hopefully I'll outlast it, right? Uh, I'm not going to practice right. too much more. So I, I don't know what's going to happen, man. I mean, I don't think any of us know. I, I think at some point, okay, you, you got to remember in the, in the big scheme of things, okay, our dental devices are gaining traction ground every single month for the last several years. We are getting more and more of the market share to treat patients who have sleep apnea. And as that happens, these HMOs are going to have to deal with, with a dentist at some point and how to do this. And then as a dentist, we got to decide if, you know, just like we had to as dentists, right? Are you, are, are you signed up with a bunch of plants now? Well, you, you know, yes, no. Uh, you know, we, we work on that same thing that we are dealing with in dentistry. We're going to have to deal with in medicine. And I, I, I'm just hoping we get a president in there that can kind of change on us, to be honest with you. Right. Well, let's not go down the political road here tonight, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. although yeah. I may agree, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I think that looks like that's it for the questions. I see the other hand raised. Hey, one more guy here. Can I do sure, that? Buddy, go ahead. Uh, we didn't get to that one. Oh, yeah. Can you do oh, sure. anything? It seems like it's all over the place. It could be our third party billing, but I'm not sure. Uh, could be, Rose, it could be your third party billing. I mean, what we try to do is we, we try to file a claim electronically, okay? And, and then about two weeks later, we, we try to follow up with it. Right to, to do that. So the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you're filing an electronic claim and you're touching those claims every 10 to 20 days, then it shouldn't take more than the days or so to get paid. Okay. If it does, then then, then somebody's not calling on that claim. Somebody's not calling. You can see. Very well. Emily. <laughs> yes. Yes, you do. Uh, you know, um, and how that happens, uh, we have your email, and um, uh, it, it will be get, uh, you will uh, we'll get to see credit for some reason. If you don't get that, feel free to contact us at Little Seed Solutions. But uh, that happens kind of behind the scenes. And I don't know the logistics on that off the top of my head. But yes, you do get CE credit for this uh, webinar if you choose. 
Um, is that it, Rich? Is that all of it? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks, everybody, for participating. Yeah, all right. Thank you for your help, and everyone uh, have a good uh, a rest of the year. We'll continue with some other webinars uh, at the first of the year, which we're working on our schedule for those. So if you're on our list, you'll get the, the notices for those, and uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll have one likely starting in January or February. We'll, we'll be finalizing that in the next few weeks. So everyone have a good rest of 2015, and uh, try to come to one of our CE courses. Uh, let us know how we can help you. Just contact our team if you just have a question. We're, we're, we're there to help dentists to do dental sleep and, and, and uh, get get more patients treated for sleep disorder breathing in the hospital. So uh, have a have a good night. Okay.